Learners, uh, thank you so much for joining us. This is Edge Blush Virtual Academy and uh, Physical Science um, with Mr. Sylvester. We are now on lesson number seven under our topic, Work Energy and Power. And uh, lesson six, we looked at Work Energy Theorem, whereby we were dealing with an incline um, a block which was sliding down and uh, we used our work energy theorem to calculate velocity at a final point or at point B. Now in this presentation, which is lesson seven, I'm going to take you through uh, another aspect of our topic, which is mechanical energy. Uh, the term mechanical energy is not new to us. We have looked at mechanical energy in grade 10 and we have looked at mechanical energy in grade 11. But however, I'm going to start by defining uh, what mechanical energy is and how do we calculate mechanical energy. Then after that, we look at the law of conservation of mechanical energy and uh, we can do an example from there. So, um, our definition uh, okay, uh, is that clear? Let me let me use another slide uh, that is clear, okay. Oh, that's fine now. So we are going to look at mechanical, mechanical energy, right? We are going to be using the very same um, definition that we used in grade 10 as well as in grade 11. And the definition that we have for mechanical energy says, mechanical energy is the sum, it is the sum total of kinetic energy, right? The sum total of kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. And gravitational potential, potential energy, right? And uh, the symbol for mechanical energy is uh, we use capital letter E and MEC as a subscript. So it's EMEC. And the unit that we use for mechanical energy, just like any other form of energy, it's Joule. And we can just represent by capital letter J, just like that. So in other words, from the definition that we wrote, we can actually come up with a formula for calculating mechanical energy, which says EMEC, is equals to the sum of kinetic energy, which is EK, plus gravitational potential energy, which is EP. So in other words, whenever we calculate the mechanical energy of an object at any given point, its mechanical energy will be equivalent to the summation of its kinetic energy and its gravitational potential energy. So if you want, you can expand this formula uh, and it becomes EMEC is equals to, from our previous classes, our kinetic energy, it is the energy that an object possesses due to its motion. And uh, gravitational potential energy, it is the energy that an object has uh, within the gravitational field. So our EMEC will be equivalent to, we expand our kinetic energy, EK is equals to half MV squared, plus our gravitational potential energy is equivalent to MGH. So this is how we calculate mechanical energy of an object at any given point. Right, now from there, we need to state also 
what we call the law of conservation of mechanical energy, which is very important in as far as our calculations are concerned. So we need to write the law of conservation, the law of conservation of mechanical, mechanical energy. Okay, then we underline the law of conservation of mechanical energy. What is to conserve in science is to keep something constant, right? We talk about the law of conservation of linear momentum, and now we are talking about the law of conservation of mechanical energy, which means there is a situation or a circumstance where mechanical energy can be kept constant. All right. So what does the law of conservation of mechanical energy say? It says in an isolated system, so you underline the term isolated, in an isolated or a closed system. You also underline the term closed. So in an isolated or a closed system, the total mechanical energy the total mechanical energy is conserved. In other words, it remains the same. So if we are given a scenario, let's say we are given an incline um, that is elevated at an angle of 30 degrees, there is point A on top and point B at the bottom. If you calculate the mechanical energy of the object at point A, and you calculate the mechanical energy of the same object when it is at point B, it must be the same, and the law applies only if you are dealing with an isolated system. Maybe we need to define what an isolated system is. Uh, we have looked at it previously in our other topics like momentum, and we realize that an isolated or a closed system is a system where we don't have any external interference or where we don't have external forces interfering with the system. And when we talk about external forces, mainly we'll be talking about forces like frictional force. So we are saying if we don't have friction in a system, mechanical energy becomes a conserved or it remains the same. So in exam, they always communicate with you. They always try to give you a clue as to whether you are dealing with a closed system or not. There are common terms that they use, terms like frictionless. So if it's a frictionless surface, then it means there is no friction, and our conclusion is it's an isolated system. And if it's an isolated system, then it means mechanical energy is conserved. Right, another term that they normally use as well in exam, term like smooth surface. If they say the object is moving on a smooth surface, what it suggests to you as a learner is that there is no friction. And if there is no friction, then it means it's an isolated system. And if it's an isolated system, then it means we can use the law of conservation of mechanical energy. We can equate our mechanical energy at any given point as long as we are still moving within an isolated or a closed system. So allow me to write some basic terms that uh, that they use to communicate that it's a closed system. Um, the first term is frictionless, right? You'll see when we do some examples from our textbook or from our exam papers, that the examiner will always communicate with you. The moment they say it's a frictionless, you must quickly underline the term frictionless because 
the examiner is trying to guide you as to the method that you must use and the type of scenario that you are dealing with. So like I said, if they say it's a frictionless surface, then it means it's a closed system and mechanical energy is conserved. Another term that they can use is smooth slope or uh, surface. So as we are going to be doing questions, watch out for these terms. And whenever you come across this term, you must underline it because it can guide us whether we should use the law of conservation of mechanical energy or it doesn't apply. Okay, so from this law, from the definition, we can actually come up with a formula that we can use to calculate any of the missing variables. So if mechanical energy is conserved, what it means is mechanical energy at point A will be equals to at point B. So we can say E make at point A is equals to E make at point B, whereby point A is any given point on the surface and point B is any other given point as well. As long as we are still within the closed system, then mechanical energy remains the same. Right. So we can expand our formula. E make at point A is equals to E make at point B. How do we calculate E make at point A? Remember from our previous definition, mechanical energy on its own is a summation of the kinetic energy of the object plus its gravitational potential energy. So E make at point A will be equals to kinetic energy, which is EK plus EP. This is all at point A, which is equals to mechanical energy at point B will be equals to EK plus EP. This is again at point B. I want us to further expand this formula and see what we get at the end. Now, how do we calculate kinetic energy at point A? Kinetic energy on its own, it's a half mv squared, right? And I want you to, I want you, to, you guys to take note of the v that we have there. When we calculate kinetic energy at point A, the velocity that we use there, it is the velocity of the object at point A, right? Plus our EP, which is gravitational potential energy, it's MGH, whereby M is the mass of the object, G is our gravitational acceleration, of which we use 9,8. And H is the height from the reference level to where the object is within the gravitational field. So normally we take the ground as our reference level. Normally, in most of our questions, we take uh, the ground as our reference level. So if the ground is our reference level, it means any object that is not on the ground that is elevated from the ground, it has got gravitational potential energy. And that gravitational potential energy is determined chiefly by its height from the reference level, which is the ground. So when you calculate E make at point A, your H is going to be the height of point A from the reference level, right? So you close, which is equals to E make at point B, your EK is going to be half mv squared. Now again, this velocity, it's going to be the velocity of the object at point B plus its gravitational potential energy, which is mgh. And this height will be the height of the object from the reference level that is at point what? At point B. So this is going to be our formula. So when you look at it, you can see that we can use it to calculate any variable that is missing. You can be given velocity and height at point A, and they give you height at point B, but they don't give you velocity. So you can come and make proper substitutions, and you calculate the velocity at point B. 
And that only stands when you are dealing with a closed system. So friends, this is the law of conservation of mechanical energy. And like I said, it applies only when you are dealing with an isolated system. Now, as you are going to be revising uh, your past exam papers, there are some questions where they don't uh, specify the method that you must use. They just say, use energy principles to calculate maybe velocity at point B. If they say use energy principles, you are free to use mechanical energy, the law of conservation of mechanical energy. You are free to use the work energy theorem. You are free to use work done by non-conservative force. You are free to use any other method to calculate network done. Right. But then we do have questions where the examiner is so particular about the formula that must be used. For example, a, an examiner can set a question and on item one, he requests you to state the law of conservation of mechanical energy. And then item B, then you are supposed to calculate a certain variable. Now, the examiner is tried to guide you if you state the law of conservation of mechanical energy on item A, item B, the examiner wants you to apply or to use the law of conservation of mechanical energy. I think you would agree with me when we looked at um, Newton's second law. In most questions, they start by requesting you to state Newton's second law of motion. Then the next question, calculate tension or acceleration. In other words, the examiner is guiding you that since you have stated Newton's second law above, now you can make an application of Newton's second law. So the same principle applies here under mechanical energy. If you are requested to state the law of conservation of mechanical energy above, the examiner is recommending that you can make an application of that principle to calculate whatever variable that is missing. All right, now I'm going to take you through an example where we are going to apply or to use the law of conservation of mechanical energy. And obviously, it means we are dealing with an isolated or a closed system. And just a reminder, we said a closed system is a system where we do not have external forces like friction. So the surface has to be smooth or it has to be frictionless, then mechanical energy can be what? Can be conserved. All right. So let's look at our example. First example under uh, mechanical energy. So I'm going to write the question here quickly and we calculate it together. Suppose we have got the following incline, right? Suppose we have the following incline um, good and then it reaches the ground or it touches the ground at an angle of 20 degrees right and there is a block that is sliding down right uh, the block that is sliding down and what is the mass, uh, the mass of the block? It's 65 kilograms, all right? So this block is sliding on its own because of gravitational force. And you know that when you are dealing with an incline, let's try to explain some few basics here. When we are dealing with an incline in science, we know that when we draw the free body diagram, we can resolve our gravitational force into its components, right? And there is a component which is parallel to the surface. It is the component which is going to actively pull the object down towards the center of the Earth. So this block is just sliding down on its own due to the influence of Fg parallel. And remember that uh, gravitational force is always a downward force. So the Fg parallel component is always facing the downward direction. All right, 
So this block is released at point A and it's going to hit the ground that is at point B. And the height now of point A and the ground is 20 meters. Right? So the incline is 20 degrees and the height is 20 meters from the ground and the block is released at point A. It is released from rest, right? So just a short explanation of the question. A block, right? A block of 65 kilograms is released from rest, right? And we are going to appreciate the word rest when we start doing our calculations, right? Is released from rest at point A, right? Um, at a height of 20 meters. At a height of 20 meters from the ground. What else? And slides down a frictionless and slides down all right air frictionless surface right um, until it hits the horizontal surface i think that is not very important at the moment so that is the scenario that we have we have got a block of 65 kg, which is at point A, which is going to be released from rest and it slides down until it reaches point B, which is further down the incline. And point A is 20 meters above the ground. Okay. So item A, draw a free body diagram. Right. Draw a free board diagram then item number b find the speed of the block find the speed of the block find the speed of the block at the bottom of the slope or at point b Allow me to add item C as well and say calculate how far the block will move across the horizontal surface. Okay, so in other words, we are going to have point C somewhere there, right? And uh, surface BC is not smooth, is not frictionless. There is friction from point B to point C. And let's say the block is going to experience friction of 400 newtons as it moves from point b to point c right so we want to calculate item number c calculate how far calculate how far the block right will move before it comes to rest before it comes to rest comes to rest all right for now let's do let's answer those three questions i'm going to divide my page into two and then we try and respond to the three questions right so a block of 65 kg is released so now i have to underline all the key terms because they are going to assist me to analyze the questions, uh, the question, so that I can calculate it easily. So a block of 65 kg is released from rest. So the term rest there is a keyword there. So it means at point A, velocity is zero. Because when something is resting, it's not moving, 
it's motionless so velocity is zero so a block of 65 kg is released from rest at point a which means our velocity at point a is zero at a height of 20 meters so our height for point a is 20 and slides down a frictionless surface i also need to underline the term frictionless it means this is a closed system so mechanical energy at point a should be equals to a mechanical energy at point b because it is a closed system okay let's go to item a draw a free body diagram okay so what are the forces that are acting on the block as it is sliding down the incline so you put your dot to represent the object um since it's frictionless there is no friction there so the forces that we have we are going to have our fn which is a contact force which is always perpendicular to the surface and then we are going to have our fg or the weight of the object or the weight of the the weight of the object so that is the free body diagram we don't have force applied we don't have friction we only have fn and fg that's it yeah then item number b let's go to item number b find the speed of the block at point b i think the question is self-explanatory friends since it's a closed system and how do i know that it's a closed system because they said frictionless it means mechanical energy is conserved and if mechanical energy is conserved it means emec at point a will be equals to emec at point b that is very correct because it's frictionless so mechanical energy is what is conserved or it remains the same so how do we calculate emec at point a remember our definition for mechanical energy it is the summation of the kinetic energy of an object plus the gravitational potential energy so e make at point a is equals to because of, of space i'm going to skip some of the steps all right so mechanical energy at point a is equals to half mv squared right plus mgh i close so half mv squared plus mgh this represents mechanical energy at point a which is equals to half mv squared plus mgh this is all at point b right so we make our substitution there half times the mass of the object or the block is 65 times what is the velocity of the block at point a it was at rest so it's zero squared plus the mass again it's 65 times 9,8 times 20. this all represent mechanical energy at point a this is equals to my space is limited here half times 65 times what are we looking for? We are looking for the speed at point B. So we are looking for this V squared. We are looking for V, right? Plus mass again is 65 times 9,8 times. What is the height at point B? If we are taking the ground as our reference level, it means our height at point B is zero, right? Now I want to explain something still on that note. Remember uh, the law of conservation of energy, the principles of thermodynamics. It says um, energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can only be converted from one form to another. So it is very interesting to note that uh, some few basics here. As the object is moving from point A to point B, you must take note that at point A, it has got maximum gravitational potential energy and minimum kinetic energy but as the object is moving down it is converting kinetic energy to gravitational potential energy 
to the extent that by the time it reaches point B, it has got now maximum kinetic energy and minimum gravitational potential energy. So at point A, it had zero kinetic energy. At point B, it now has got zero gravitational potential energy. Why? Because the object, when it's moving down, it was converting all of its gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy. So at point B, the object is now on the ground. The object now doesn't have any gravitational potential energy. So you take your calculator now, you simplify the kinetic energy at point A gives you zero because it was at rest. So that zero nullifies everything. So we need a calculator for gravitational potential energy. So it's 65 times 9,8 times 20. Right? And I'm getting 65 times 9,8 times 20. I'm getting 12740. Right? 12,740 which is equals to gravitational potential energy also gives me zero there because height is zero. So I'm getting 65 divided by two, which is um, 32,5. So I'm getting 32,5 V squared, right? So you divide both the sides by 32,5, divide both the sides by 32,5. Because of my space, allow me to square both the sides right so my v is equals to uh my v is equals to the square root of um uh, 12740 divided by 32,5 i'm getting um uh, 19,80 meters per second Right, so this is the speed or this is the velocity of um, the object at point B, right? How did we manage to get that? We applied or we used the law of conservation of mechanical energy. Where did we get the green light? It is a frictionless surface, meaning to say it's an isolated system and mechanical energy of the block is conserved or it remains the same. So mechanical energy at point A is equals to mechanical energy at point B. Then you substitute and you get your answer there. All right, item number C, which is the last one on this question. Calculate how far the block will move before it comes to rest. Oh, I forgot move there after will, okay. Calculate how far the block will move before it comes to rest. Okay, so the block reached point B, moving at 19,8 meters per second. And our assumption now is the block is going to stop at point C. And it means at point C, the block is going to stop. In other words, the velocity or speed at point C is going to be zero. But something very interesting here, they introduced a new component there. Now, the surface BC is no longer frictionless. There is now friction. Still, we don't have force applied, but now we have got friction that is acting on the block as it moves from point B to point C. So if I am to draw a free body diagram for point B to C, I am going to have my Fn, have my Fg and have my friction. And we know that friends, Fn and Fg, they do no work because they are perpendicular. So the only force that is doing work, it is frictional force. And this explains why the object eventually comes to a stop because frictional force is the only force that is acting on the object and it slows down the object until the object stops. I want to take you back a little bit when I introduced the work done. Remember I said we have got three types of work done. We have got positive work done. When we have positive work done, it means the object has gained in energy because work done is equal to energy transferred. So when we have got positive work, it means the object has gained energy, right? 
When we have got zero work done, it means there is no change in energy. The object did not lose, did not gain, because the force that has been acting is perpendicular. It creates an angle of 90, of which cos 90 gives you zero. And then when you have got a negative work, it means the object has lost energy, right? So if friction is the only force acting on the block from B to C, and friction, we know that it does negative work because number one, your theta is greater than 90. Theta for friction there is 180 and cos 180 gives you minus one. So friction always does negative work. So friction is taking away energy from the object. That's why we have got negative work done until all the energy from the object is gone and then the object comes to a stop, right? But the question is looking for how far. In other words, if the object is moving at 19,8 at point B, how long, how far is it going to move before it comes to a stop? Considering that friction is acting on the block, all right? So I think we can make use of our work energy theorem here. Yeah? It allows us. Why? Because we have got velocity at point B and we have got velocity at point C. So our work energy theorem can work, right? And remember our network done in this case, it's only going to be work done by friction because Fn and Fg, they are perpendicular, they do no work, right? So the work energy theorem says W net is equals to delta ek right and our network done will be equivalent to work done by fk which is equals to half mv squared f minus half mv squared i right let's expand how do we calculate work done by friction it's equivalent to the frictional force the magnitude of friction times displacement times cos theta. This is all equals to half mv squared f minus half mv squared i, right? We are given friction here that is acting on the block. That is 400, right? That's the magnitude times displacement is what we are looking for. So how should I indicate displacement here? Because I'm going to have uh, double x here going to create a stress for us. Uh -huh. Okay. Let me just maintain delta x times cos now. When we calculate work done by a constant force, how do we determine our theta? Right. Remember we said theta is the angle between force and the direction of motion. Right. So where is the object going? The object is going towards C. In other words, the object is going to the right. And friction is going in the opposite direction. So your theta is always 180 degrees. Right. And I substitute on the right-hand side. It's going to be a half times. The mass is still the same, 65 times. What is the final velocity? That is when the object has come to a stop. It means our final velocity is zero squared minus half times 65 times. What is the velocity of the object at point B? It was 19,8. Now, I want to explain what we call positive marking here. Suppose your velocity at point B was wrong. That is your B calculation was not accurate. But you realize that you need that value uh, the answer for item B, you need it to substitute it for your initial velocity under this uh, calculation. If that answer was wrong and you take that wrong answer, you come and put it here, you get benefit, yeah? uh, benefit of doubt. And we call that uh, positive marking because we assume maybe the calculator did not perform well, maybe the battery is finished, but at least the learner knows could we need that velocity to substitute it there under the initial velocity at point B? Okay, and don't forget always to square because this is kinetic energy. Okay, let's quickly do that. Um, so 400 times displacement times cos 180 
if you have your calculator there, you realize that cos 180 is minus 1. So you don't have to calculate that. So I'm going to have minus 400 delta x. This is all equals to, okay, so it's 19,8 squared. How much do I get there? Okay. Uh, times 32,5. Times 32,5. Then I'm getting 1,2,7,4,1,3. So what do I do here? I divide both the sides by minus 400. Okay. Minus 400 minus 400. Okay. So, oh, this one is minus as well because it's zero minus. So it's minus as well. So this one, this one goes. So my delta X is going to be 12741,3 divided by 400. Okay, then I get my delta x is 31,85 meters. Good. So that is the displacement. So in other words, what we are saying here is from A to B, it's a closed system because it's frictionless. So the object was released at point A and the object slides down towards point B and mechanical energy was conserved. So if we have got velocity at point A, we can quickly calculate velocity at point B using the law of conservation of mechanical energy. We did that and we got velocity at point B, which is 19,8. Now, from point B to point C, there is friction now. And because of friction, the object must eventually come to a stop because friction is doing negative work. It's taking away energy from the object. So now the question on item C is, how far will the block move before it comes to a stop? So it means velocity at point B is what we calculated, which is 19,8, and velocity at point C is zero because the object is now stopped. So work energy theorem can work, and of which our net work done is equivalent to work done by friction. So work done by friction will be equivalent to the change in kinetic energy of which our final velocity is zero and our initial velocity is 19,8 uh, squared, right? Then you substitute there and you get your displacement of 31. So if you are to go back to the diagram, the distance between B and C is 31,85 meters. That is the distance between B and C when friction was acting on the block. Thank you so much, friends. This is how we make application of mechanical energy. And this is how it works. So this question actually was a combination of a um, closed system and a non-closed system where we could use our mechanical energy on point A, B, and then point B to C, we go back to our work energy theorem. In our next presentation, we are going to be looking at um, work done by non-conservative force, and that is going to be our last formula that we use, and um, then we are done with our topic, work energy and power. Thank you so much for joining us. We love you all.